So I am going to say a very few words on behalf of Bothmer School uh, to introduce this first session, uh, which is looking back at the first 50 years of our institute. Um, it feels to me very appropriate that it should be Bothmer School making the sponsorship because, as many of you will know, we are also uh, celebrating our own first 50 years of practice uh, in Bothmer School. And it feels to me that uh, the early years of our institute and the early years, particularly of our Wellington office of Bothama School, are very much interwoven, um, particularly through the, the mahi of uh, Frank Boffa, Gordon Evans, and as we know them, the, the two Steves, uh, Dunn and Drakeford. Um, so without any further ado, I would like to welcome you to this first session, and I know that we're all going to be fascinated to hear those reflections on our first 50 years as we proceed during the rest of the conference to look forward to our next 50 and beyond. So thank you all. Kira, thanks Rachel. Um, 50 year parties all over the place by the sound of it. Um, uh, I'd just like to um, just uh, outline the programme for this morning. Um, this is the uh, Fai Ficado reflection session uh, that kicks off the conference uh, through to the lunch session today at 12.45. Um, this morning we have Frank Boffer presenting background context to the formation of the Institute and the first 25 years that followed. Um, then we'll have some morning tea where we'll serve the, uh, the cake uh, that we, we cut earlier. Uh, and then we'll invite Di Mendes to come up onto the stage to present her um, Te Hokinga Mahara challenges and successes and this cover off the second 25 years of our profession. Uh, so let's jump right on in um, and let me introduce a man who doesn't need an introduction, uh, Mr Frank Boffer. Thank you, Henry, and uh, thank you to the sponsor of this session, and in particular to um, our Papa Tanuku, uh, Rachel, or the Bafa Miskel one, I should say, our Earth Mother. Um, kia ora nortato, ko ko kapiti te motu. Kia Waikonai te aho, no te takotai o kapiti aho, ko Boffa toku Fano, ko Frank toku inha inghu inghua, sorry about that. He kai hoho o te fenoa ohu, no raya. Tenakoto, 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 Katoa. And I must acknowledge that lovely potpourri we had too, that was quite moving on this special occasion. I'm going to read most of what I've got here um, for several reasons. One being that I tend to wander off the subject a little bit or get my digress and then I forget where I was up to. And at my ripe old age, you, you have seen your moments. So to avoid any embarrassment to you and particularly to myself, I've, <laughs> I'll stick to the script as best I can. Um, I, I don't mean this to be a history of landscape architecture 101, but um, it may come across a bit like that. But I think it's important that some of you who uh, a few years younger than most of us, although I look around this room and it's such a youthful bunch for, a, for an organisation that's 50 years old, and that's, that's testimony to where it's heading. I, I think you've got some exciting years ahead, and we had some exciting years in the last 50. Anyway, as one of the founding members of the NZILA, I'm particularly honoured to be here to celebrate this 50-year milestone with you all. The theme of the 50th anniversary conference very aptly translates into walking backwards into the future with eyes fixed on the past. Over the next two days, we'll celebrate and reflect on our past and how we in Aotearoa, New Zealand,
got to where we are today as both a profession and an organisation. And more particularly, we'll also look forward to we will also look forward to prepare for the future challenges and opportunity the profession to a, to a Peter or a, our institute will no doubt encounter. Oh, sorry, this is where it is. How do I change the slides? <laughs> yeah. That'd be the big green button. No, that one. Oh, that one. That one. <laughs> <laughs> the big one. The big one. Green, big green one there. Yeah. Oh, you yeah, press it. Do you want me to it? Didn't work. <laughs> well, you know what I'm like when it comes to the technologies. Well, I'll, I'll proceed anyway while Henry sorts us out. <laughs> well, the history of the modern landscape architecture profession is relatively young internationally. Prior to the establishment of the first full-time postgraduate course at Lincoln College in 1969 and the formation of the NZILA in 1972, landscape architecture in New Zealand was a relatively unknown profession. Notwithstanding this, there were some significant landscape uh, undertakings carried out in the early part of the 20th century which have stood the test of time. One of these, or one of the more iconic and enduring landscape design projects is Cornwall Park here in Auckland, commissioned and gifted to the City of Auckland by Sir, Lo Sir John Logan Campbell. The park was designed in 1901 by Austin Strong, a young American landscape architect who was brought out here to do it. Uh, Austin Strong was a protege of the legendary Fran Frank, Frank, <laughs> Frederick Law Olmsted. <laughs> Excuse me. Fred and I were mates. Uh, <laughs> the designer of Central Park in New York and the Golden Gate Park in uh, San Francisco, which we all know about. Sorry, Frank, just to, um, you've got to hold it. Oh. It, can't, it won't work if it's stuck onto it. Um, oh, yeah, so okay. Yeah. Thanks, Henry. Thank you. I'll probably forget that. Um, <laughs> other earlier um, notable landscape designers to practice in New Zealand were Fred Schott, a Swiss-American landscape architect who practiced in Auckland, Rotorua and Wellington in the 1920s and 1930s, and Alfred William Buxton, a well-known and respected Canterbury nurseryman who designed many large rural estates, gardens, parks and domains throughout the country during the first part of the 20th century. There were no doubt other horticulturists who designed significant public parks and gardens, including botanic gardens, the results of which we all revere today. It worked. Following the Second World War, New Zealand experienced greater and more widespread change. With the rapid growth of urban areas and communities, new roads, extensive and more intensive rural development and production, along with the growth of infrastructure and development projects, the necessity and opportunity for a recognised landscape profession became further apparent beyond the realms of rural estates, public parks and gardens. Helmut Einhorn, an architect who emigrated to New Zealand in 1939 and worked with the Town Planning Division of the Ministry of Works and Development, and George Malcolm, a New Zealander with horticultural background and senior landscape officer with the Ministry of Works and sorry, with the Ministry of Works Housing Division, were two particular individuals who advocated for and spearheaded the profession within central government during the 1950s and 60s. And I know you've heard mention, made mention yesterday of George Malcolm and there are a lot of people, well quite a few, of the older people in this room who probably um, have a lot to thank, uh, particularly to George Malcolm, who was a great mentor to a lot of people. Henry? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here we go, here we go. 
Notwithstanding the advocacy and works of those earlier landscape professionals, the foundation for the New Zealand Institute of Landscape Architects can largely be attributed, attributed to Lincoln College and more particularly to Charlie Challenger. In his ornamental horticulture lectures, Charlie introduced students, including myself, to landscape design, a field he was deeply and keenly interested and had a deep passion for. When I look at that picture of Charlie, you know, <laughs> you had to experience Charlie. He, he, was, he was a fantastic individual. He didn't suffer fools, and um, probably Jan could stand up to him, but <laughs> the rest of us couldn't. <laughs> In 1963, Charlie took an overseas sabbatical to learn more about landscape design and the direction it was taking in Europe. Having further developed his interest and seeing the wider scope of what landscape design entailed, Charlie was granted leave in 1966 to study landscape architecture at U in the UK at Newcastle University. In 1969, Charlie returned to Lincoln College to set up the landscape design program which offered a postgraduate landscape design, a postgraduate in landscape a diploma in landscape design, and a certificate in landscape design. Both courses commenced in February 1969. Sensing some trade opposition to the Lincoln program and appreciating the need to secure international opportunities for the Lincoln graduates, Charlie sought and gained individual membership with the International Federation of Landscape Architects, IFLA, which Di will probably say a few words about later. The organisation that represents professional landscape organisations throughout the world. In situations where there was no existing professional organisation within a country, IFLA had a mandate to appoint individual members to the Federation until there were sufficient member numbers to form an organisation. Charlie Effective became the placeholder for what eventually became the NZILA. In November 1972, a group of largely based Christchurch, uh, uh, I'll get this right. In no November 1972, a group of largely Christchurch based landscape practitioners agreed the time was right for the establishment of a professional organisation in New Zealand and applied for registration of the NZILA under the Incorporated Societies Act. This move was vigorously challenged by the New Zealand Association of Landscape Designers, who had earlier set themselves up as the country's first collegiate body of landscape practitioners. The association, who had perhaps more of an occupational interest rather than a professional interest in the landscape, argued that they, as the first established and registered organisation should represent the profession in New Zealand and that there was no need or justification for a further organisation. We, however, were able to defeat the association's challenge due largely to Charlie having had the foresight excuse me in 1968 to secure our recognition and inter international status with IFLA. Incorporation was finally confirmed on the 3rd of January 1973 by the Justice Department and the New Zealand Institute of Landscape Architects was born. While our relationship with the Association of Landscape Designers was strained for some years, we soon accepted each other's position and following a joint conference in the early 1980s, we agreed to work together to achieve our shared vision. I left a paragraph out and, I, and I'm going to read it. Uh, if you just double back to just before I got on to Charlie, <laughs> even with the best laid plans, screw up. I just wanted to say when I was talking about some of, you know, I was talking about George Malcolm and Helmut Einhorn and, and those others, there are two others I should have acknowledged. During the early 60s, Harry Turbot and Jim Beard, both New Zealand trained architects, completed postgraduate studies in the USA and eventually returned to New Zealand. While many of the earlier landscape projects were carried out by people with horticultural backgrounds, 
both Harry and Jim added an urban perspective to landscape practice in New Zealand. Jim eventually became a member of the NZILA and served on the executive committee from 1981 to 1985. Harry, unfortunately, never joined the institute. I never actually met Harry, although I knew of his work, but I, I think um, it was our loss that he never joined the institute. He was quite a competent individual. Back to the text. There we go. Following the registration of the Institute, which involved some late nights and a hurriedly put together documentation package to the Department of Internal Affairs, we spent some considerable time on the refinement of the procedural and constitutional changes, uh, which had been largely put together as a cut and paste, borrowed from other kindred professional organisations. And when I say cut and paste, it's not the way you do it today. It was literally cut and paste. While the changes themselves were not significant, the documentation and uh, documentation process and procedures were challenging. However, once we sorted out our housekeeping, our pr priority was to create an identifiable image and branding to assist with our professional, professional promotion and marketing activities. The key element of our branding package was the logo, designed by Michael Cole, a British-trained landscape architect who held a teaching position at Lincoln College during the mid-1970s. Prior to Michael's arrival, we had been struggling with options and focused on landscape themes featuring mountain lakes and trees, you know, the usual thing we were desperately trying to get out of the garden design image. The Tiki design, as it was fondly referred to, was for a strong international symbol that would represent who we were and where we were. The logo was enthusiastically received by the membership and has remained unchanged for the past 45 years. While there were moves to redesign the logo in the 1980s, the membership overwhelmingly endorsed our now familiar logo, <coughs> which may, perhaps with time, require some restyling. However, hopefully it might do us proud for another 50 years. Throughout the early years, a major part of our campaign for recognition focused on promoting the profession and the institute, a challenge and responsibility we all took to with enthusiasm. The promotional activities included presenting conference papers, writing countless articles for a wide range of publications, speaking to community groups, schools, various interest groups, being involved with community, environmental and conservation organisations, and getting involved in whatever and wherever we could. It could be said we made a bit of a nuisance of ourselves at times, but anyway, that, that was the way it was. We, were, we had fire in our belly and we were, we were going for it. Thankfully, we also had a sympathetic audience as the environmental movement following the Save Manipuri campaign in the early 70s was creating a wider awareness and concern for the environment and the landscape in general. By the late 1970s, we had, a, we had the confidence and support of many professional organisations, individuals and commercial enterprises, as well as local, regional and central government agencies. As an institute, we also made many submissions on parliamentary bills and eventually learned that while the select committees were generally sympathetic to our concerns and suggestions, politicians invariably made their decisions based not so much on whether they could support our position, but whether they could sell it politically. In those early years, it was hard work. It was challenging, it was exciting and thoroughly rewarding. While we were still relatively small in numbers and widely dispersed throughout the country, that did not deter us, as we had become a close-knit group, very collegial and totally committed and driven to succeed. Um, that bunch of hippie-looking people there. Uh, that photo just arrived uh, uh, to the Institute's archives a couple of days ago and we managed to slot it in. So I won't explain it, you can see the names there. In the early years of our, 
In the earlier years, our conferences were biannual, with the NZILA members often attending and participating in other professional conferences, workshops or seminars, often as a group in the intervening years. We held joint conferences with the Institute of Agriculture Science, the Planning Institute and the Institute of Surveyors. All of our Institute conferences were well attended, even the AGMs. The establishment of the Institute branches was also a key part of our development and promotion strategy, as it enabled members to have more regular contact, support and effective participation in local and regional activities and promotions. While on the topic of conferences, we've held many important educational workshop, event, educational workshop events, including some memorable milestone conferences. I'll briefly comment on three particular conferences, which in my opinion, greatly shaped and sharpened our professional focus. The 1981 conference, New Zealand Where Are You? did not set out to have, a land, have landscape architects talking to each other and learning from each other as was often the case in our early workshops and conferences. The 1981 conference brought together a range of outside speakers who presented their respective thoughts and feelings about the New Zealand landscape and the natural and cultural forces that were continuing to shape it. I recall Charlie Challenger summing up at the end of this particular conference by saying words to the effect, and Charlie had a gruff way of saying things, and I won't try to imitate it, if we as landscape architects are still struggling to find out who we are and where we are and where we are heading, we now have a greater awareness of where we ought to be. The 1987 conference, Two Cultures, One Landscape, held at Teati College and organised by Alan Titchener, and his Hawkes, Hawkes Bay Conference Committee introduced and brought into focus the need for a great awareness and understanding of our bicultural landscapes. This very successful conference was followed in 1998 with a special issue of the landscape, our flagship publication devoted to Maori attitudes to the land and the landscape. And you recall last night uh, Boyden Evans was received a President's Award and, and Boyden was one of the real movers and shakers when it came to the landscape. It wouldn't have been that particular publication if it hadn't been for Boyden. During our first quarter century we have hosted many distinguished, sorry I beat the gun a bit here, in 1998 the, com the 1998 conference Today's Actions Tomorrow's Landscapes was not only a celebration of the first 25 years of the NZILA, it was also a joint conference with the Landscape Industries Association, the same organisation who challenged the Institute's registration in 1972. Overseas keynote speakers from the USA were John Dixon Hunt speaking about reinventing the local, Joan Nassau, who came to New Zealand several times, uh, spoke on landscapes for our children, and Jim Sinatra from Australia gave an engrossing and thought-provoking presentation on local knowledge as a driving force for regional expression. During our first quarter century, we have hosted many distinguished overseas landscape architects as speakers at conferences and or regional workshops. In those pre-COVID face-to-face -face days, we often had our visiting guests tour the country pre or post-conference to meet with local branches. This also helped us gauge how we in New Zealand were performing and established useful ongoing contacts in terms of current overseas trends and techniques that we could explore and or adopt. At the risk of sounding presumptuous, our overseas colleagues were often surprised at what we were achieving down under with many taking back some of the approaches and techniques that we were developing and practicing in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I want to say a few words now. Um, that clock's got the wrong time on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that the minutes I've got left? <laughs> okay. Um, Six forty-two is pretty early in the morning. <laughs> uh, being a practicing landscape architect over the past fifty years or so, 
I'd like to reflect on some of the social and politica, political events that in my experience have had a significant influence on the professional practice, employment structures and work opportunities and in particular those that had their beginnings during this turbulent period of the third national government, 1975 to 1984, followed by the fourth Labour government between 1984 to 1990. While perhaps not popular at the time, on reflection, many of the experiences and outcomes from those turbulent years have, in my opinion, significantly assisted our professional development and maturity. During the 1970s, New Zealand had issues with increasing levels of unemployment, Britain joined the European Union, and we experienced two major oil shocks. We also had carless days, and, a, and for some people, a four-day week. While these events were not necessarily related, they were factors that influenced government policy. In an attempt to counter rising unemployment, the PEP scheme, which was the Project Employment Program, was introduced in the late 1970s. This initiative aimed at local authorities essentially made funds available from central government for specific community projects to provide work for unskilled labour. Seizing the opportunity to get parks and open space projects underway, as most landscape ar architects at that time were employed by central government, um, some local authorities sought the services of consultant landscape architects to design, supervise and manage the government funded work on their behalf. Often Miskell as a young practice certainly benefited from this steady flow of work, albeit fairly basic landscape design and construction work. As an unintended consequence, I consider the PEP scheme helped raise the profile of landscape architects in the eyes of local government, who subsequently gained the confidence to employ their own in-house landscape staff. Um, I'll add lib here. That particular project you're looking at was designed by Steve Drakeford, and um, that's in Porirua, and that was done, what, 30-something years ago, maybe 40, and it never, ever experienced any graffiti or vandalism. It was a bit like the mafia, say, you know, you touch on my car, I punch at your face. <laughs> <laughs> and it's endured. It's, it's quite remarkable. So it just shows if you, you know, how you can approach projects. Um, following the oil shocks, during, oil shocks during the 1970s, which had a flow-on effect on the economy, the national-led Muldoon government embarked on its Think Big policy, which resulted in the passing of the National Development Act in 1978. A justification for many of the Think Big projects was for New Zealand to become self-sufficient in transport fuels by the year 2000. The National Development Act was enacted to expedite planning approvals by simplifying and speeding up the consenting processes which were perceived as being held up by the Town and Country Planning Act and the Planning Tribunal. Sounds familiar, doesn't it, today? In order to implement these large energy-based projects, significant and or new servicing infrastructure was also required. This resulted in a flurry of activity involving new roads, bridges, power supply, treatment plants, outfalls and the like, which essentially created work opportunities for landscape architects. Examples of projects that were planned and or implemented during this period include the Sinfuels plant, the petrol gas methanol plants in Taranaki, as well as onshore and offshore oil and gas projects, the ammonia urea plant, compressed natural compressed natural gas and liquefied petroleum gas, pipelines and storage, hydro, coal-fired power stations and gas-fired power stations, the Aramoana smelter project, which never got off the ground, and a range of other public and private initiatives. As the scale of these projects was huge, and in spite of the fast tracking of the approval, that's the consenting process, there were now reasonable and widespread public and community expectations regarding environmental and landscape impacts. In addition, landscape considerations were fast becoming an important and integral consideration with regard to site selection, site planning and development, the consenting process and the design and implementation of landscape mitigation measures. 
While I was fortunate to have, been a re to have had a reasonably significant involvement in a number of these projects, I acknowledge there were landscape architects who opposed or sought in principle not to get involved in what might, might be seen as support for the Think Big program. My attitude was that the projects were going to go ahead regardless of what I or our profession felt about them and that it was more important to be involved in influencing and helping shape the outcomes. Clearly during this period there were tensions within the profession during those turbulent years, but we survived them. Notwithstanding the trauma of significant and rapid change, not, sorry, notwithstanding this, the trauma of significant and rapid change did not stop with the Think Big era. Following the defeat of the Muldoon government in 1984, the Labour-led government of David Lange immediately repealed the National Development Act, as you would expect, and set about deregulating the economy and dismantling and privatising the public service, including many of the organisations that employed a large number of the country's landscape architects. This subsequently resulted in a rapid growth of private sector self-employed landscape architects. While I do not have specific figures, I estimate that in the early to mid-1980s, probably 70 to 80 per cent of landscape architects were employed by local or central government, and that, with, and that within 15 years this figure reversed and the 70 or 80 per cent more likely represented the number of employed in private practice. With the introduction of the Resource Management Act in 1991, the economy was still feeling the effects of the international stock market crash in 1987 and the economic recession that followed and carried through to 1983. In retrospect, I think it's fair to say that by 1995, we had weathered the social and economic storms of the 70s and 80s and were now ready for the opportunities the RMA had to offer. While it took a little time for us to come to grips with the RMA, by the mid to late 90s we were ready and prepared to embrace, flourish and grow with an RMA framework that promised to deliver much of what we had previously advocated and strived for. Having survived many turbulent years, we were now sufficiently experienced and mature to meet the challenges of the next 25 years. This slide got a little ahead of me, but uh, I just want to say a few things about technological advances because, as you know, technology is my forte. <laughs> <laughs> While I have briefly highlighted some of the changes that occurred during the profession's 25 years, it would be remiss of me not to mention the technological changes that have no doubt will, that have and will no doubt continue to influence the way we as landscape architects operate and practice. When I commenced, pra commenced practice in 1972, I suspect many of you had not been born and consequently have never given too much thought as to what a practice might, practice what it might have been like during those early years. Paperless desks and offices were not even on the radar. Tra tracing paper, yellow and white, yellow for preliminaries and the white for the inking up, Felt tip markers, letter set, masking tape, pencils, pens, multiple scale rules, plastic templates and erasers, including scalpels to do the ink job, um, the ink erasing I should say, were the tools of the profession. All our plans were hand drawn and copied using an ammonia printer, and if you haven't smelt them <laughs> you don't want to, and the text was produced on a typewriter using carbon paper for extra copies until the electric typewriter revolutionised report writing in the 1980s. The light table was an essential part of our toolkit and cut and paste were lateral, lit, literally that. We had no access to photocopiers until the mid 80s and then we had to go out to get copies from various agencies. There were no fax machines, there were no couriers or cell phones, we were reliant on landlines, pay phones, where you put a bent penny in and it wouldn't work, there were no, uh, and the post for communication. We used email, there was no email. Cell phones, as I recall, were not readily available until the late 90s. There was no internet or social media during the first 25 years. To get the latest information, we were reliant on books, magazines, and letter writing. Notwithstanding these limitations, we coped 
as it was all we had or indeed all we knew. I wanted to go back, but it doesn't matter. Oh, forget it. Um, <laughs> on reflection, I on reflection, I regret having. Oh, it's catching up. I, I I'll start again. On reflection, I regret not having embraced the digital technology early in my career. I admit to this. In admitting to this, I rue the fact that many of today's landscape architects appear to be losing the skill of hand-produced graphics. Personally, I find a well-drawn plan, diagram or sketch far more seductive and convincing than most computer-generated presentations. Finally, and I'm going to be on time, or am I over time? No, I'm on time. In conclusion, being involved in the first 50 years of Tuia Peter Ora NZILA has been a wonderful and hugely rewarding journey and experience and one that I have been very fortunate and privileged to have been part of. Today the landscape profession and the institute is recognised and respected throughout Aotearoa, New Zealand and indeed throughout the world. I wish the profession and each and every one of you well with your future endeavours and I'm heartened and confident that you, the new generation of landscape architects and landscape planners, will continue to grow and further develop what we started in 1972. Following the morning tea break, Diane Menzies, who is no doubt well to all, who is no doubt well known to all of you, will take you on a journey through the next 25 years, being the period between 1997 and 2022. This will be followed by a panel discussion chaired by Simon Swafu. So thank you very much and uh, I look forward to seeing you all in 10 years at the 60th. <laughs>